want to discuss some uh, leadership styles internationally valid leadership styles and uh, I want to start with one general valid international leadership style the coercive leadership style what would you think is a coercive leadership style. What is a coercive leadership style? If you can say it in two, two words. Um, discipline, um, order. Orders, very good. Do what I say. Do what I say in some short words is the coercive leadership style. The question is, the coercive leadership style works in which situation? As an example, coercive. When do you think works the coercive leadership style best? Do what I say means that you have immediately compliance. You have to follow. In which situation is the right leadership behavior? You. Yes. Um, I don't know, but I believe there are some nations. Some nations? Okay. Um, especially uh, the country I come from. Uh, and I think such <coughs> leadership style is the only one with which we can manage the people. Um, both everyone thinks he's doing the right thing, mm -hmm. and uh, there is no coordination between the people who work in a team. Okay. Everyone has his own theory, okay. and no one wants to believe that the leader has the best idea. Mm -hmm. It's a lack of coordination, lack of coordination, and, and to improve over overconfidence. In okay. Overconfidence in, in a bad way. And in which economically situation? In a bad, I would say. In a bad situation, do you want to say something? In deep higher constructions. Pardon? In deep higher constructions. In deep hierarchy. Huge hierarchy situation. <laughs> yes, it's exactly in the bad situation, in the turnaround situation, for example, then do what I say could be or is in general the right leadership style. And in a crisis, turnaround I mentioned before. And what is the critics at this leadership style? What do you think? What could be critical? Do what I say, turn around, crisis, and what could be a critical view? What could be dampened? Or what could be less? No yes, no creativity. It could decrease the motivation structure of your employees in the long run. So, it is, in this case, a balance. Number one. Number two, what could be... An affiliative leadership style. What is an affiliative leadership style? The second one. Affiliative. If we have it in two or three words, what could be affiliative? What do you think? Affiliative. What is an affiliative leadership style? You have an idea? You? Uh, actually, when you run a, uh, an organization like a, when, while making everyone participant feel part of a group, mm -hmm. and so Very good. like um, a club, participation yeah. like a club, yeah. a little bit like the situation people first. Affiliated leadership style, people first, and this uh, style engenders the motivation and creativity of people. And what do you think, in which situation is it useful? Affiliated leadership style. Well, what situation is happening in your team? Focus on team, but in which situation? 
Yes. When you want to combine different ideas and develop something new, uh, because you're not in a crisis uh, situation, not in a crisis time, and want to go a further step forward. And then you need to combine different ideas and expert uh, grounds to reach the, and up, the, the next step, the next level. When the team coherence is important, the moral and the team spirit should be increasing. Then, affiliative could be the right leadership behavior. And what is the critics? What is the critics? What could you, what do you think could be critical of me? <laughs> what could be a critic, a weakness in this style? What do you think? Please. It could be less efficient. Yes, it could be less efficient. And it could be maybe a lack, a lack of overall direction by your employees. They are missing direction. This is the other side. Weakness. Then we have another style, and the third one is the democratic, democratic leadership style. <coughs> if you have it also in the political thing, democratic leadership style, and we will hear later also in our guest lecture maybe some ideas. Democratic leadership style. The style builds what? The style is a consensus builder. The democratic leadership style builds consensus. <laughs> For consensus, through what? Through which behavior? You are building consensus in your team. Through which behavior? Think practical. Democratic. What means democratic? In this framework, you are seeking what in your team? Any idea? You are seeking input, ideas. You are looking for ideas in your team and you offer the team a participative leadership style. Participation. Participation, democratic leadership, participation. And when do you think it is working best? What do you think? What do you think could be the situation working best for this style? It's most appropriate in which situation? You? Who is? No, behind you. No, 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 you. Yes. What could be the idea? Most appropriate in which situation? Democratic leadership style. Any idea? It could be appropriate if individual responsibility is needed. If individual responsibility is needed and organizational flexibility is occurring, for example. What could be a weakness? What could be a weakness? It could be, if you think on decision making, if you think on participation, there could be a lack of what? Well, there are several problems, I like guess, okay. democratic leadership style. First, there is this classical dictature of the majority. Okay. So, well, to reach a consensus, then that the minorities will try to, well, accept the view of the majority, even if they're not completely mm -hmm. agreeing with it. We will later hear something about it. And uh, secondly, there is also the fact that, well, without clear goals, it may very well, uh, well, it doesn't go forward without real goals. That's, that's, the, that's a big point. 
that people maybe are working, but there is no result at the end. <coughs> then we have another one. It is the pace setting leadership style. What is pace setting? What is the strength and what is the weakness in which situation you can adapt it? What do you think? Pace setting. The style expects something from your employees. What could be the expectation? Who has an idea? Expectation for the pace setting. If you are the leader, you are the pace setter, you are the delegator, you are delegating. And what could be? <laughs> Maybe to get as much done as little time as possible. As or much until the deadline. Okay, but what, what are you expecting before this? You are expecting high excellence in your employees and a big self-direction. You are thinking they have high competence quality, qualities and they have a, a big portion of self-regulation, self-direction and then you can, if you are trust them, and trustworthiness is the next point, then you can give them pace. You can give them pace, pace setting in the sense of delegation. What is the weakness? What could be a danger? What could be a danger in this slide? Self-direction, <coughs> self-regulation, high competence you are expecting, excellence. What could be a negative side, a downside? The people could feel that they are overwhelmed, that they are overwhelmed with these lots of paces you are setting and these lots of excellence you are looking for in the team or in these in your subordinates that could deepen decrease their motivation their maybe their internal motivation that is pace setting now we have a number five and maybe you all know it from athletics and you can transform also athletic styles into business leadership styles. And one of these styles is the coaching style. Coaching. What is the goal of a coach? Think on soccer or, or leadership in the companies. What is the goal of a coach? Or a leadership coach will who will bring more excellence out of the executives. They are programs. What is the goal of a coach? Any idea? You make the followers greater than they were before the leadership, meaning that to make them overachieve their own capabilities. Okay, can you can you go more in detail? What what is the coach's idea. The coach wants to help for identification, but in which direction? The ident identification of the strengths and the weakness of the persons which you are coaching. You want to develop the personality or competencies or other characteristics which are fitting in your organizational structure. You want to develop the strengths and identify the weakness. What is the reason when coaching is unsuccessful? What could be the reason if a coach is unsuccessful? What is the reason? Think practically. What could be a reason if a coach is not successful? Maybe the 
doesn't understand the, the employees or the abilities of the employees. Okay. Okay, misunderstanding, misunderstanding, but there's another point. Misunderstanding, okay, but this would be a problem in the internal from the coach. But there could be another problem, think on the employee or on the peer. What could be a very human problem? I learned the followers are not responsible or experienced enough. It might be like the failure of the coach. Yes, and, and what could be, please? The, the, the employees might feel patronized mm -hmm. by the coach. Yes, patronized, or the employees are not willing to change something, or they are resistant to learn something new. And you have this, of course, in the company realities coaching and the problems of coaching. And now I want to give you some short idea from uh, the view of the Italian economic minister, Padua. I have heard him. I was invited some days before in the university and he gave us a speech. And I will shorten it. He, of course, he supported the central policy from Draghi and he spoke about north-south transfer and all these things. But one point is very interesting, and this is a point maybe we hear also from our guest lecturer in this point. He said two things for me and I never forget it. The first thing is he recommended our leadership or our policy or our leaders in policy, he recommended thinking about new policy design, new tools. This was the first interesting recommendation for me. I will give it to our guest lecturer. And the second from Mr. Padoan was he recommended and he favored in the policy the inclusion as a part of leadership behaviors and leadership policy. So, now I want to introduce and welcome our guest lecturer today from Landesbank Hessen Thüringen. Hela Bach, she is the chief economist, head of research, Dr. Gertrud Kraut. A great welcome to you, to our lecture today. I want to, I want to introduce Dr. Kraut with uh, some facts from the biography. Dr. Traut has been the chief economist of Hellerbach Landesbank Hessen Thüringen since 2005 and assumed the position as Hellerbach's head of research in 2006. She began her career at Bank Julius Baer in Deutschland in Frankfurt, where she later became the head of the economics department. In 1999, she took over the position of Head of Equity Market Strategy for Institutional Customers at Bankgesellschaft Berlin. There she was also responsible for leading the equity market strategy for the European Securities Network, a research network of the European financial institutions. As a senior vice president, Dr. Traut is a member of several adversary boards including the Science and Future Council of the Hessen Ministry of Economics, Transport and Regional Development. Over and above her activities in the financial sector, she is also involved in the fields of science and academia. She has given lectures, for example, at the Warsaw School of Economics and taught at the Frankfurt School of Finance and Management. Dr. Traut is a contact person for both the print and television media, 
in which she makes regular contributions and appearances. On top of that, she is a regular speaker of financial conferences. And Dr. Traut studied economics and received her PhD from the Johannes Gutenberg University in Mainz, Germany in 1996. A warm welcome to your <coughs> lecture today. I will look at the stick, one second. <coughs> So, it's your auditorium, and I think you.
new government. <coughs> and actually, it didn't matter. If you look up at the economic performance of Spain, it just continued. Unemployment rate continued to decline. Uh, special investment goes in infrastructure and in the building sector and uh, all over the country continued to increase. And so it didn't make a difference from economic factors compared to last year when they still had a government and within the last 10 months, months when they did not have <coughs> So I would say this is kind of frustrating. Do you think that it doesn't make a difference whether Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton will win the ele elections, uh, the presidential election, elections, next week, or two weeks, or on, on November 8th. Does it make a difference? Yes, it does. So you see, you see, of course it makes a difference. Or I would say it makes a difference. But if you, if you listen to economists, they very often say it's not, it's not politics. And most people still say it's all about economics. But who decides the economic environment? Of course the political leaders. I did my dissertation on optimum currency area in the European Monetary Union. Before the European Monetary Union was created, constructed, misconstructed, I would say. So it was foreseeable that everything which happened would happen. And honestly, I was uh, really, I was very skeptic about the European Monetary Union and I thought there is a risk of high deficits and free riding. And it happened. But it took quite a while to become obvious. And then I saw it in the first years, I was too negative. It was, everything was so great. We had a housing boom in Ireland. We had a consumption boom increase. And uh, labor costs went up strongly, but nobody cared because money was there. Interest rate went down. Uh, so there was no inflationary trend, what most economists feared at the beginning. So it was positive. Was the European Monetary Union a political or economic decision? How it was constructed? And the, the range of members which started from the very beginning and then joined, Greece for example joined in 2002, so three years later. So was it a political or economic decision? Any idea? Of course it is a political decision. It's the idea to, to let the U Europe grow together to, to build sooner or later a political union and one milestone would then also be the European Monetary Union. But if the European, per, European Monetary Union would have been constructed, like it should have been constructed, we would have had, sure it would, we would have had strict rules. We never had strict rules from the very beginning. So it was a political decision. It was a political decision who would be in and who would join later. And when I did my thesis on the optimal currency area, I looked at all the different criteria which were in the market by then. And Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, Belgium, also, Belgium had a high deficit, uh, but still, since they had a European Monetary Union, a monetary union with Luxembourg, people thought it will, this, this won't be a problem. France, yeah, looking at some criteria, yes, looking at other criteria, no. Spain, getting more difficult. Italy, getting even more difficult. You, you are too young to remember, but it's so, I think it's kind of funny. If in the early 90s, the deficit in, in Italy was around 160% of GDP. 
And the master criteria, the deficit, is 60%. You've probably, probably heard of that. So before Italy joined the European Monetary Union, the deficit was reduced from 160% in the direction of 60 down to 120, 130, depending on the year. And then it was decided they are on track. They are heading in the direction of 60. And when the European Monetary Union started, they just stopped changing anything. And they have still the same level which they had when they joined the European Monetary Union. So all this complaining that everything <coughs> went so bad for Italy when they joined the European Monetary Union, that is it's kind of ridiculous. They just continued to be the way they were before. So Italy is changed like Italy is. And a deficit is not a problem in itself. If you have enough a uh, high level of, of taxes, a low level of interest rate payment, it doesn't matter how high your deficit is. And you, you've probably heard of the book uh, from uh, uh, Kenneth Rogoff and uh, Reinhardt. Uh, this time is different. Some people have, have been discussing about this 90% thing. Of course, and people have been uh, laughing about this kind of <coughs> calculation in the book. This is not the important point. But the whole book is telling us there is no level from which on it's getting really serious. It depends on the country. And if and if you look at the US, they have a deficit of around 90% something. Nobody cares. This is a leading economy, and people think that they get their money back. And it doesn't matter whether it's above 90 or below 90. So it's just, it's all about trust. And if you talk about trust, it's all about leadership. And it's all about people. So for me, I think it's always about people. And with the whole discussion about economy, is about people. So I am I'm quite convinced that, of course, political leaders matter. And I'll show you an example, which I think is a very disappointing example, but it shows what can happen if you have a weak leader who pretends to be or to have a democratic leadership style. But because he is so weak, and I, I, like, I like the answer, uh, the risk of a democratic leadership style, it's dictatorship of the majority. One of you said that just a couple of minutes ago, and that is the risk. So think about that. If somebody tells you he's so, so extremely democratic, and he asks everybody, I would say, doesn't he have any ideas? Doesn't he have an idea where he wants to go to? So it depends on, on the people. Uh, and so, therefore, I see a big risk. And still, I'm, I'm, I'm a favor of, uh, of, of elections, but uh, I think referendums are extremely dangerous. Because referendums, you don't ask the majority. You ask the majority of those who are on the right and on the left hand side. And people in the middle, they usually say, oh, it's more, it's more complicated than that. I have to know all the arguments, but I have just one cross to make. And then you just get the left and right extreme sides. So it's not democratic. And if you listen to uh, politicians in Germany, those who ask for referendums are those uh, on the extreme borders. It's not the, not the parties in the middle. I brought you some more questions. Does anybody remember the phrase, it's the economy stupid? No. Ever heard? Heard it. Um, I think Wolfgang Seutler. 
then brought it to Mr. Tsipras, I think, and he was not sure um, if um, Wolfgang Schäuble told this that. But I think there was someone who told this phrase before him. But and I don't you, have, you, have, you have an idea? I don't remember. And anybody up, up there? It was the uh, advisor of uh, Bill Clinton in the 90s. Yeah, 92, in the presidential campaign. And it was, they, they had three phrases, and the three phrases were change versus more of the same. And then it was rather for the internal campaign, for the, for the team to have, to have this slogan. So the first was change versus more of the, of the same. The second was the, the, the original was not if the economy is stupid, it was just the economy stupid. And the last one, don't forget healthcare. And uh, in, in early 91, uh, when George W. Bush uh, was still president, the economy was in kind of good shape. And that uh, changed during 91 and, and early 92. And then, and then everybody focused on that. And the labor market is reducing, our uh, unemployment is rising, economic factors do matter. So this hits the economy stupid, uh, shifts the idea a little bit apart from the person, but what Bill Clinton, Bill Clinton, that is the husband, the old guy now, uh, who was president in the United States in, in the 90s. And Hillary now wants to be the, the next president. And I still would say, you were saying, it's, it's the economy is stupid. And look what's the case now. And if the situation is decelerating, I'm, I am the one who is able to change that. And then, again, political leadership matters. So I'm, the, I'm really convinced that uh, it depends on the people, and I can give you more examples. We wouldn't have had European, uh, first of all, European Monetary Union, but we also wouldn't have had German reunification if Helmut Kohl wouldn't have pushed for that. It's really big movements, big decisions are made by people. And now I come to my big example from a couple of months ago, there was the idea that this is extremely democratic. And there was June 23rd, when the British population was asked whether to remain or to leave the European Union. And as I said before, Cameron, the former Prime Minister of the UK, is responsible for this referendum. And why did he come, did he create this idea to, to make a referendum? <coughs> the British did that already in, I think, in the 70s, uh, shortly after they had joined the European Union. Yeah, in the uh, in the 70s, they had their first uh, referendum. By then, it was rather the Labour Party who opposed the European Union. And the Tories were rather in favour. This time, it was completely different. There was UKIP, this right wing party. They got bigger support. Uh, and there were parliamentary elections. Uh, last year in the UK, and there was, uh, yeah, I would say some some members of the Tories, of the Tory party, who started to oppose uh, the European Union. It's a fashion in the U in, in in the UK anyway. So you're always against the EU, but at the end of the day, you say, okay, due to economic aspects, it makes sense. 
But most people say it's not so emotional like for Germans or French or Italian, whatever. It's just a rather an economic thing. But when UKIP uh, gained support, and by that time, uh, unemployment rate in the UK was relatively high for uh, the UK. Uh, some of the Tories thought, oh, I don't know whether I really want the UK to stay within the European Union. And then David Cameron was, that's my strong, strong view on that. David Cameron was not strong enough to say, I think the EU is a great thing. We benefit from it, and of course it also has a price. And we are not like UKIP. We see we have advantages, and of course we have to pay for it. But he did not have the guts to do so. So he, he promised, if I win the election, the parliamentary election, you're going to get a referendum. And then he got into this referendum. And he complained, uh, you is great. Uh, they got some, uh, in, in early this year, there were negotiations with the EU. So they got, again, some privileges like maybe Thatcher got uh, in the 80s. Probably you have heard of the phrase, I want my money back. This was the, the woman with the handbag on the table and strong position. I want my money back, so she got a discount. So it worked in the past. Again, Margaret Thatcher, it's a political, political leader. Whether wrong or right, but she had a view and she pushed people forward. But David Cameron, he did not have a view, but still he pushed people forward. And for, for banks, for economists, for newspaper, everybody was talking about this special day, June 21st, what's going to happen. And most people thought, and the polls also forecasted, that the UK will stay in the, in the European Union. And then they voted, only it, it was very sharp, but then they voted leave. And they were surprised, the political leaders, even those who were in favor of leaving, were surprised by the result. <coughs> the mayor of London, Boris Johnson, is a oh, oh, I am not responsible. I was just having for I just wanted to have fun. <laughs> and then they had the result in DC. It's not the U, it's not the UK. Uh, which have a very uh, homogeneous view on that. It is London, Remain, we have Scotland, Remain. There's not a discussion that Scotland, and they have ever had a referendum two years ago to, to leave the UK as well. Scotland wants to be a part of the European Union. And they think about now to leave the UK when they leave the European Union. And you see, it's rather the countryside, so the people, well, like outside here, almost 60% of the countryside who voted to leave at Scotland and London for Remain. But <coughs> just looking at what you said, a consensus builder, yes? <laughs> There's a kind of a consensus. Is that the consensus they wanted? Looking for participation. <laughs> yes, you you are 50% of the US and uh, UK, you are responsible for the result. And you've probably heard that, that uh, the younger people in the UK complained that the older people went to the polls and that therefore the leave votum was about 50%. And I said, sorry, younger people, you have a right to vote. It's you have to vote. And if you do not go voting, 
you give up your responsibility and you lose the right to complain. So this, blaming now the old ones, again, the younger people are responsible because they did not the voting. The political aspects, the political leaders, they do matter. So what, what else did you say to the democratic leaders dying? Yeah, this dictatorship of the majority, no process, no result. We'll see. These are the guys <laughs> which are responsible now. They are in the prime minister, Theresa May. She was uh, a supporter uh, of the EU, uh, but now she's changing because sentiment in the UK is changing as well. There's kind of, a, and I have friends at, uh, at universities in the UK, uh, some are from Sweden, others are from Greece, and they think there is this feeling of not being welcome anymore. So it's getting extremely dangerous for the UK. It could be that the well-educated, people with two, three, or even more languages start to leave the country because they do not feel welcome anymore. And why? Here we have our friend, Boris Johnson. And this is a smart thing that Theresa May uh, gave him this job in the government. Because if he wouldn't be in the government, he would be anywhere and tell how bad everything it is, what Theresa May is now doing. Now he's responsible and he's rather quiet. You, you don't hear a lot what he's saying now because he has nothing to say anymore. He, he is realizing that he is responsible for all this trouble now. But there will be, sooner or later, a result or process. So this so-called Article 50, uh, which is uh, a chance for a country to leave the European Union, Theresa May just said, uh, yes, we're going to ask for leaving the European Union at latest by March 2017. And then they have two years negotiate. And then you ask yourself, they voted for the leave in June, and they wait until at latest March. So nine, nine to ten months. And it shows they didn't have an idea what it really meant for them to leave the European Union. So they have to find a strategy and this is the situation we are in now. So Theresa May is saying we're going to have hard negotiations. What does that mean? So they will start to negotiate, and they have two years. If, if they're not going to find a solution within the two years, they can, of course, increase the period. But the Article 50 says, that then there would be automatically a divorce. And then they are out. Without having any privileges they are having now. They would be out with everything without trading, not only in the financial sector, but also in real trading goods and services. And you see, I put some other political aspects. And that's just not so much here, but here, that I think that political aspects really matters and political leaders do matters. It could be, I would say it's not rather uh, likely, but it could be that Marie Le Pen is going to be the next president in France. And that would change not only the EU, that would change the European Monetary Union. Probably she would leave the EU and at the same time, time the Monetary Union. <coughs> just because she thinks France is good enough just 
for itself. They don't need that stupid German with all these competitive companies putting pressure on the French companies. So this idea that competition among companies is bad is spread within Europe. And Germany is blamed for being competitive. And again, when you listen to those people, you realize usually it's that these are the weak political leaders who want to blame somebody for their weakness. <coughs> is, is an exit from the Brexit possible? Yes, of course. Theoretically, it's possible. So it could be to just ignore the referendum. Would that be smart if you ask the people and then ignore the people? Ah, you're right. Second referendum. You ask as long as, as you get the result you want to have. Politically, it's dangerous. Negotiations with Brussels, rather unlikely. Telling uh, people in Brussels, you know, we want to have more privileges. We want to pay less, but we want to have all the privileges, and we won't pay anything. Unlikely. The Parliament stops the Brexit. There is a portfolio manager, a woman in the UK, who uh, says that this referendum is completely irrelevant because the Parliament has not been asked. The Parliament has to invoke Article 50. So Theresa May is listening to said she did not say that that is going to be decided by the Parliament. But she said, oh, we might discuss that within the Parliament. Uh, yeah, you could yeah, snap the election lead to a new government. Uh, Scotland vetoes Brexit. Yes, also possible, but unlikely. Again, uh, Scotland <coughs> and who would rather say, keep trimming. They made up the mess and they have to go through. How, how much they like it or not. So this is our uh, part of our research we did on that topic. And for an economist and for a research department, the whole thing is a lot of work for us. So we had, we started doing uh, studies in February, March this year, discussing different scenarios. And we had this remain scenario, and we thought that, that would, we thought it would be 60%, and the three leave scenarios altogether 40%. So we thought after June 23rd, early in the morning, 20 Friday, I'll never forget, Friday the 24th, everything is history. And on, on late uh, evening on, on the 23rd, everybody was still extremely optimistic. And I thought, oh, we did so much work on all these scenarios. We wrote hundreds of pages. We were calculating. We had, for our weekly publication, we had completely two different papers. And we, we calculated everything through. We did that all for our bank. What's going to happen if the Brexit's going to come? What does that mean for GDP, CPI, for the exchange, for the equity market, for the bank market? What will the Bank of England do? What will the ECB do? What will the US dollar do? What was going to happen all over the world? So we have these different scenarios. And as I said, I thought uh, in the morning uh, we're going to throw it away and go back to daily business. But that didn't happen. We made a big cross in here and have now those three scenarios. The one we call the agreement, that's the scenario we think is the uh, most likely. They will negotiate, they get uh, some 
yeah, in some point, we pretty much in other ways. They don't. The clash scenario, that is what Theresa May lately said, we're going to have hard negotiations. And that's very dangerous mm -hmm. for the UK because they would lose at least a big part of their financial sector if the banks, which are located in London, uh, lose the right to do business, financial business, in the EU outside from the EU. So you need this uh, EU passport if you want to do, uh, uh, you want to supply financial services in the EU. So this is the most important thing. And this charity scenario is also a dangerous scenario if Theresa May is from a, a British perspective extremely successful. She would, she would get all the privileges the EU would uh, stick to the EU passport, so that could do financial business out of London, so no impact on Frankfurt, uh, so negative for Frankfurt, but good for London. But in this scenario, we would, I would forecast that that would be the beginning of a breaking apart of the European Monetary Union and the, and the EU as a whole. Because other countries would say, oh, this is a good story. We get all the advantages and we're not going to pay for it. And of course, every, every country would have uh, asked for that. And then we, this is a scenario which is rather risky. So you see, what, what just one political leader can do if he's weak and if he pretends to be a democratic leader. Extremely dangerous. So some of the charts, uh, what it's all about, what is important. We have countries like Germany <coughs> who are strong in exporting goods. The, the, the British economy is strong in exporting financial services. The British opened their borders very, very early to Eastern Europe when, they, when the Eastern European countries joined the EU. So many people from Poland and other countries came to the uh, to Great Britain. So all this being negative about strangers <coughs> It's not about the refugee or migrant crisis. It's rather about the discussion uh, migration from the EU or countries which joined a little bit later the EU. And of course, many people came in within the last 15 years. And it's normal, like my Greek friends uh, now being at the university close to London. Trade, our trade balance, if we look at uh, trade and, and goods, and if we look at trade and services, you see that the UK is having a surplus in services, and especially most of it is financial services. <coughs> and therefore, this EU passport is so important. If the EU passport is lost, would be extremely negative for the, depending on the method you count the people in the financial industry in in London, it's around 400,000 or even if you take, take all the other industry, financial service industry around the banking se uh, sector, it's up to 700 people in, uh, in London. It's about the population of Frankfurt as a whole. We are 720,000 uh, people living here. So there is a surplus in services and there's a deficit in goods. So the, the question with regard to goods is not so important. So I've talked about that, how many people live in the financial industry, which is creating surplus in the financial service, and you see the differences between the two centers. And we are not naive saying if the EU uh, or the UK will leave the EU, 
that Frankfurt could be just from one day to another the European banking center. We have 62,000 people working in the financial industry in Frankfurt, compared to almost 400,000 in London. So it's rather small. But this is not the question anymore. The question is now, which other cities or which other countries are now our competitors? Do the bankers from London come now to Frankfurt to serve Europe as a market? Or do they go to Paris? Or do they go to Dublin? Do they go to Barcelona? Do they go to, to Luxembourg? Or do they go to Warsaw? So these are our competitors. And we think we have calculation just assuming that 5% of the bankers in London leave the country. You can realize how big the impact is if only 50% of that would come to bankers. It's a real big impact. And that price of housing price would go up for time. <laughs> Do you believe it's probable that, for example, the there was talk about a fusion of the London Stock Exchange and the German Stock Exchange? It's, it's not so just talk. It's, it's, it's happening. It's, it's happening. still <laughs> happening right now. So obviously the, the Brexit was a huge a shock accident. <laughs> a huge accident for that. So how do you believe that will turn out? Because obviously the the employees of the London Stock Exchange will have to go somewhere and they probably will go to Frankfurt. So will that strengthen the, the migration of other financial institutions into Germany and into Frankfurt specifically? Uh, I, I think the the idea having the headquarter of this new company, this more merger, having even Without Brexit, having the headquarter in London was not a good idea anyway. So uh, looking at the market cap, the bigger part and the stronger part is the, is the, is the Deutsche Börse. Mm -hmm. So we, we argue and we say, put the headquarter has to be here. And if the headquarter would be in Frankfurt, we would say, okay, let's go for this merger. We would propose it, but there are other questions now that the new commission is uh, deciding whether this big company, super uh, boards, would, would be too big. I think it's more unlikely now that's, that's really going to happen. But I think it, it cannot be that this, com this company would have its headquarters in London if uh, the EU loses the EU passport. So, what's going to happen if they start negotiation or uh, with all this discussion is going to continue? We have GDP, the contribution of GDP, and within the last two, uh, two years, capital expenditure was rather high. So companies were saying, oh, well, this is a good location, we want to be in the UK. But it's not unlikely that besides the financial industry, other companies say, oh, if they lose all the rights within the EU, we're going to do our investment out of the UK. So that is something, of course, we cannot see in those figures yet. But the risk is high. And if capital expenditure, expenditure is going to drop, then people would, or the company would stop hiring people. So unemployment rate would go up, and consumption would go down, and the risk is that sooner or later the UK would go into a recession. We have calculated it through a net impact on Germany is rather small. It's only, from, from our perspective, it's only 20 basis points, and other regions in the world are stronger. So our GDP forecast is now even higher compared to the situation before. But there is an impact. There are other research institutions, their forecast a recession in Germany due to the Brexit. I would say that's it's rather unlikely, but that's, that's our business. So some forecasts 
say this way as I say the other way. Looking at the indicators, this is a PMI, the composite indicator for the manufacturing and service sector. And you see this was a big crisis, everybody, each country in the world was the same chart in, in Germany as well. So this was just shortly after the voting. Sentiment went up again. Because a little bit we think it was kind of overdone, but you see our forecast. We think the sentiment will turn again. We see the housing market is changing already. Housing prices in the UK, which were expensive, starting to decline. Companies start to tell that they stop investment. So we think that the sentiment and the leading indicators will calm down in the UK. The Bank of England, they uh, went back to their purchasing program and they reduced interest rates uh, to lower the burden if all that what I just said might happen. So you see how big the impact was. Just a weak camera and finally the whole world is changing. Strong impact on the exchange rate. Extremely weakening of the British pound. And the, the, the 90, uh, is that what our forecast is? It was a couple of weeks ago when that was in the newspapers, people got nervous, oh my God, uh, the economy is extremely weak. As I say now, our oh, weak currency is good because it helps the exports. But then if you look at the structure of the exports, it's just financial services. And financial services are not dependent on the exchange rate. This is rather when you have trade, when you have goods. So strong, strong impact on interest rates and on the exchange rate. But why do we discuss that all that here in Germany? It's also important for us. The UK is our third important trading partner with regard to exports. And you see, the most important is the US, then France, and then the UK. From the import side, it's rather un uh, unimportant. I always say, oh, what can we import? Whiskey, not that much. We, there's no other country in the world which buys more cars from Germany than the UK. And therefore, the car interest in industry worries if there would be trade barriers again, then they might sell fewer cars, and that would of course then affect the German car industry, which is uh, not measured on, uh, on, on the employees, the number of employees, but measured on the volume it's the biggest sector in Germany. So if our car industry would collapse, of course the whole economy would be <coughs> So it's important that in the negotiation, the rules on the trading with goods would be rather open, and the rules for the trading with services would be rather restricted. Otherwise, Germany would suffer. So this is uh, overall, I and mean, you see if I net that, it's even our second important body trading partner. Looking at the leading indicators in the Eurozone, no impact so far. So you see most uh, companies say so far we, are, we do not feel affected. So the idea that the Eurozone or Germany is going to fall into Session due to the Brexit, I would say it's rather unlikely. This is our forecast for global growth, and for global growth, we have changed our view at all. So we have, have a small impact on the US only, we have small impact on Germany, not this year but next year, but overall we haven't changed anything. Uh, there are other big countries like the US, like China, which are more important. And to sum up, looking at the market, this is June 23rd. You see, this 
was, I can tell you, it was quite exciting this Friday morning. I love that. So you would put out our Brexit papers and everybody was saying, oh my god, disaster. We said, oh no, don't worry. We have a research paper for you. You can read what's going to happen. So for a researcher, if you're already pre prepared, it's really fun. So this is what we expected. So that, uh, of course, our interest rates uh, went down strongly for a short period. You see the impact on the exchange rate, and after a couple of days, was uh, happy disappeared. You see the impact here. Again, interest rates now are even higher compared to the situation before. So the bond market and the currency markets are telling you about. For the time being, we do not, uh, we do not care. We care again if we know which scenario is going to materialize, whether the cherry picking or the cream and the flat. Looking at, this is even more interesting, looking at the equity market, the British stock market went up strongly. And it's much higher than before. Looking at the other markets, the US stocks and the US market, uh, US markets also up, but not as much as the British market and about the same as the European market took a little bit longer with the European market. Why is the British market so much up? When the currency is telling you, do you remember the currency is still down? The euro ignored it again, but the currency, the British pound is still weak. And the point is, since the the Bank of England reduced the interest rate and increased liquidity. All this liquidity is flying into uh, the equity market, pushing equity markets up for the time being. But if you invest from a German perspective, you have gains in pounds, and then you calculate back into the euro, you have you have uh, not uh, you, you haven't won anything. So it's the two aspects which, is, uh, which are really important. So this Brexit thing, a decision of a weak political leader, has shown in that in indication on the capital incursion markets. It has an impact on the financial sector, Paris, Frankfurt, Warsaw, and so on. It has an impact on the direction of the new policy. The future of the Eurozone, other political aspects, and of course the trade of Europe and the Eurozone. So this is, and I'm going to start here with the UK to sum up and to show you how much a political leader can do wrong and right. And if we say it's the economy stupid, I would say it's just like leaning back and not responsible. Each of us is responsible. Each political leader is responsible. And this is my, these are my two, my last two slides. Coming back to the next <coughs> big decision President <coughs> in the US. And what does that mean for the economy? If a Democratic or a Republican president will win. Regardless how that program looks for the time being. And if we look at the specific person, like Hillary Clinton, she's having her own problems. And Donald Trump is kind of a whatever. <laughs> but just looking at being an analyst, looking at the past, intuition would say equity markets favor Republicans. But that's not reality. Reality tells us that this is the election day. After the election from a Democrat to a Republican president, 
equity market went down and after a year did not come back to the level we had before. So with the Democratic president, they had a performance of about 7%. This is just the average. So let's look why was the performance of the Republicans so bad. So if Donald Trump turns into a real good guy and reduces regulation again and it's not going to uh, harm globalization, it's not going to start trading war with China, it's not going to it's not going to destroy uh, the trading negotiation um, the NAFTA and if, if he's not going to do everything he's saying, of course there's a chance that it's going to also be positive. <laughs> Looking in the past, we have George W. As you see, his performance was not very good. Eisenhower's performance was, at the beginning, relatively good. Nixon was not relatively good. Reagan, and most people think that Reagan, that he had a great performance, but he didn't either have it. So, at least some of them were not as bad as George W. Bush. And most analysts and most uh, portfolio managers, they know these charts and therefore they worry so much. So they realize Republicans could be negative. And therefore we are doing the same exercise now like we did for, for the Brexit. We published two different scenarios for the day after the election. A change, of course, our forecast depending on whether Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump is going to win. And to start the whole presentation now, of course, this is the most important thing for a researcher in a bank. The disclaimer: I did my best. But I'm not responsible. Thank you. Thank you very much for this really great presentation and the deep insights in the developments of the impact of political leadership. And uh, now we have the opportunity for questions and answers. Are there any Questions from the auditorium to Dr. Traut, please. Are there questions? Here, please. I have a question about the transference that you talked with the lady in front of me from London, the capital markets from London to Frankfurt. Don't you think that uh, like the monopolization that would come of that from the Germ Germany in the European Union would contribute to the uh, like the, the end of the European Union and other countries being uh, very unpleasant with that mon monopolization and that would contribute like like as if the Brexit was the beginning of the the whole concept that we have, which is a this, this, this is a good point, and some people argue that Germany is already so strong, and if then uh, the super uh, merger of the United Stock Exchange and the Deutsche Börse would then also be located in Frankfurt, that would be then this monopolistic uh, situation. And this is, these are the arguments uh, which are heard in Paris, for example. And that might I think that might be right because there's also a risk if too much power is just in the super merger. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do not support this view that everything has to be bigger and bigger is always better. So I wouldn't say that is, well, I, I would say it's not a problem if this merger will not come through. And also political aspects. But this political aspect is another aspect than the economic aspect. If 
the CEO of Deutsche Börse, Kangeda, would be here, he would argue, this is great. If we are the big, the big super börse in Europe, prices will drop, uh, the clients will benefit, it's good for everything, we would be more efficient, we would be faster and cheaper and better. That's what you want, don't you? <coughs> so then you see the arguments depend whether you look at it from the company perspective or if you rather look from political and other aspect, aspect, perspective. And then this is just it's not an official view. I think it's, it would be a disaster if we're not going to have this merger. And maybe also do that uh, political aspect if the other countries would be kind of upset having the super birds in Germany. And Deutsche Börse is, is strong enough even by being Deutsche Börse, that's my argument. Thank you. Any more questions? Please, you have the opportunity. What is that? Please? Sorry. Um, how likely do you think it is that Marie Le Pen gets elected as president of France? I think it's rather unlikely. Give us uh, a percentage. Percentage? We have, uh, it, it depends on who's going to be the candidate of the conservative. No, it really depends on. If, if it's going to be a Sarkozy uh, in the conservative party, the probability that Marine Le Pen uh, will win will be higher. If it's not Sarkozy, it will be lower. But we haven't done that yet because we have first to know who's going to be the candidate from the uh, Conservatives and from the, from the Socialists as well. That would be too early, that would be uh, a waste of resources. More questions, please? Do you see the Italian referendum as a problem for, the, for Europe? Or especially for Germany? No. no. <laughs> the, only, the only person who thought it might be a problem yeah. was uh, Renzi. But he realized, he, he was saying, if it's not going to go through, he will step down. He's not repeating that anymore. Yeah. So uh, I think it would only be a problem for Italy, but not for the rest of the for the rest of the world. One more question? Hey, please. What uh, impact does that do the Brexit has on the daily life in Milano? Uh, from March to June, we were quite busy <laughs> writing studies on Brexit, giving uh, many, many presentations to uh, local and international clients. So we have been talking about that almost every day. We have uh, made scenarios for our uh, internal uh, risk control within the Halabak. So if the Halabak calculated that through as well, if there is this negative impact, if, if it would be forever what it means for, for the bank. And the an analyst is just uh, a great thing because we can we can analyze and build different scenarios. But it's a big topic. It's, it's been a topic for the last couple of months, and still is a topic. And that's why I've chosen it for today as well. One more question, please. Uh, what do you think would be a reason for Scotland to, uh, to uh, veto the, the Brexit or to maybe to just exit the UK? Uh, the, the, the Scottish people want to be European. Do you think it is likely that they will? It is. It is. It's, 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 it's extremely likely. They had a brethren two years ago that they wanted to leave the, uh, the UK. They are more in favor of the European Union than the British. You said for him that uh, you said earlier that it would be impossible to do a veto Brexit. So why don't they just do it? <coughs> uh, they could. They could, but most of the aspects I showed here were just intellectual exercises. <laughs> I think everything what's on here is not going to happen. It's rather like it's all fantasy.
it's a political decision mm -hmm. and Theresa May, she is now the one who has to be the leader and now she has the pressure and to push it forward. It's theoretically an option, but I'm not. One more question. Okay, thank you very much once again. Once again, we have a gift for our guest lecturer, and we want to make a photo together in front of this uh, auditorium. So we go this way. So we can, you can take your seat. You can take your seat. So here, this is uh, the gift from uh, the University of Frankfurt.